even though I believe uh, all of our books have been used to help people, this one probably trumps the other ones. That's just my opinion. I don't know what Jennifer thinks. But I read through it. There's more how-tos in this book than the, in, than the uh, original ones. And I think it's mainly because the how-tos uh, also have stories that go along with it. So if a person's trying to figure out a, what exactly you're saying, a lot of times a story does it all. But it's way more detail. It's more granular in the how-tos, so to speak. So I encourage you to get a copy. You can only buy it here until December 17th. You can get it nowhere else but here. Okay, this evening we're doing part two of vision adjustment, vision adjustment, and vision, as we touched on in the last message, utilizing the scripture without a redemptive revelation, the people perish. In other words, many people have substituted goals, ambitions, dreams, wishes for a genuine redemptive revelation. And I'm concerned about as we mature in the Lord, we need to expect, we need to expect our vision to mature, our, pers our overall vision, meaning the way you look at things most of the time. Say that with me most of the time because all of us probably have still have some some vision that is immature and childlike and, and in some respects that's good you want to maintain that because you never you, know, you never outgrow the fact that you're a child of God but there are times when all of a sudden there is a shift in your life did you hear that crack did you hear that noise that was paradigms coming down <laughs> we're cracking paradigms we're gonna shift into a new dimension all right, so if you didn't hear that noise, I did, and it's prophetically speaking to the, to the structures in your mind that are coming down already. Oh, my goodness, I can see the dust already starting to settle as the walls come tumbling down with those mental strongholds. And so resistance is broken, so now I can begin. But I've used this for years um, as an illustration to, to um, kind of give you a perspective of what I'm talking about about vision um, and it's found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Verses 12 to 14, it's, a, it's, it's uh, even the heading in my Bible says the spiritual state, or it's a condition. And... I want you to see it as a redemptive revelation. What do I mean by redemptive revelation? Revelation means you're seeing through the eyes of God, correct? When you see revelatory, you're seeing in the spirit realm the way God sees it and the way he's trying to portray it to you. So to open the eyes of your understanding, you want the revelation to see it from God's perspective. However, as children of God, as born-again believers, we have a tendency to develop and mature in the way we perceive. And so the easiest way to, to explain that is in that portion of Scripture in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. He speaks to three groups, but don't misunderstand that these three groups are, are uh, age groups. It's spiritual condition or a spiritual state group. You know, somebody could get saved at the age of 60 they would be basically a baby Christian regardless of their chronological age. So in the context of looking at spiritual condition or the spiritual state, it says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. When they see that little children, 
This applies to all of us, but there are some people who basically, most of the time, their perspective of their Christian walk is getting God to move in their behalf. And pretty much, without them realizing it, their center, their world center, their worldview is pretty much their welfare, their victory, and their blessing. Which, even though it's legitimate that he wants to give children good things, and that's a stage that we all must learn. We must learn that we are dependent upon him. And that, that you never outgrow being a child unto the Father. Um, but at the same time, if your worldview gets stuck there, you need vision adjustment. In other words, you've got to see from a more mature worldview, and what was the key word? Most of the time. That's how you can tell if you've graduated in your perspective. If there's been a vision adjustment, there will be an awareness of your perspective beginning to change. And so he says, I speak to you, little children. And I'll picture now, picture a, a room full of people that are uh, new believers. And they're all 50 years old at plus. Picture that room. A lot of nice silver hair. All right. And in that room of wise people, he's saying, I speak to you, little children, because they had just gotten saved. And your sins are forgiven. And when they realize the starting place, the first thing that God does with a baby Christian, regardless of chronological age, are you with me? You're all picturing this room full of, of uh, 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 people 50 plus in chronological age and the apostles talking to them and they're in a room and they're all new converts. They're about a year old in the Lord. And he says, I speak to you, little children. Would that, be, that would not be talking down to them, would it? He'd be saying, you need to know that your sins are forgiven and that forgiveness has cleansed you and gave you a brand new life and you're, you're a new person. And he will probably answer many of their needs supernaturally quickly. Why quickly? Because they need to know that when they cry out, somebody responds to them. Exactly like a nursing baby. Babies cry if they are going to thrive and build internal confidence, they're going to want somebody to respond when they cry. So the primary vision of, I speak to you little children, regardless of chronological age, would be, there would be a tendency to focus on what God is doing for me in my world, and getting will be a primary focus of their redemptive vision. Legitimate revelation, but a focus of primarily getting. Do you agree that as important as that is? Because that's going to build your security, your sense of safety, and your sense that you can trust God to provide. I cried unto the Lord, and he heard my cry. We all need that. And at that stage, once you see that he's supplying you, then you hunger and thirst. He creates, he creates a desire. They used to say that a midwife would take oil and put it on the palate and massage the palate of a baby that didn't want a nurse. And it literally would tease it till it wanted to nurse. They would tease the palate. And I believe God does that in the spirit realm. He basically teases you by answering your prayers quickly when you're a new most of your major revelations and much of your dramatic experiences happened immediately after conversion and quickly. You didn't wait 10 years for it. It happened fast because God was building the safety and the security so that you'd be a healthy child and then literally create a desire for you to want the sincere milk of the word that you could grow thereby. All right? So you, he creates a desire by showing himself strong on your behalf rather quickly. However, the problem with that is that you have to graduate eventually from that. He's going to want to wean you and get you to the place where you're eating solid food. And who does solid food belong to? To the mature. Those who by what? Reason of use have had their senses exercised. But primarily, the child, the child is their redemptive vision. Their vision is adjusted pretty much to get. 
And like we said, you don't punish them for that. It's a necessary part in growth, and it's a necessary part that will stay with them even well into maturity. However, there needs to be a vision adjustment to where you enlarge your vision. And I really believe God's speaking this to the church right now, and we'll, we'll cover some of that later. But just to give you a picture, he goes on to say, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. And for many years, I used the same illustration because I haven't thought of any other ones. So I used the old ones. But it would be the little children is you pray for stuff and God supernaturally, even in little things, provides for you just to show his tender love for you. But the point is, the day is going to come when you're going to realize that you're going to have to not have your whole Christian world view about you being the center of your personal welfare, your victory, and your blessing. And one of the most important things to do is to recognize your calling. And with your calling, your general calling, that applies to everybody across the board, baby Christian, mature Christian. Your primary calling is to be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means you serve him. It's not about him serving you, even though he proves himself strong in your behalf. Do you believe we need to balance that out? Is that really it's not about him serving me. He's not the sugar daddy in the sky that takes care of me. He's basically provided for me, but what he's given me the grace to do, and this is a good definition of grace. Grace is the empowerment to obey. A lot of people like this just stop with unmerited favor, but in reality, it's the empowerment and the grace is the ability to be or to become and to do or function out of the grace of God or the power of God, and it enables you to supernaturally obey by the Spirit as opposed to willpower or dead works. All right? If I, if I didn't lose you on that one. But... I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. And then he builds security in them, and he answers their prayers quickly. And at that point in time, you know, that, that child's whole focus is on what I can get from God. And he builds that into them. But then he weans them gradually, and he says, desire the sincere milk of the word. And as a baby... I speak to you children, the focus is going to change from getting. All of a sudden, there's a vision adjustment that says, I speak to you. Well, it goes back and forth here. In verse 13, I write to you fathers because you've known him who was from the beginning. But I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. I've written to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. So somewhere, somewhere the young man or woman of God somewhere there was a transition that first God produced security and he showed you answers prayer quickly and you, all of a sudden you see get, get, get. God really is my source. God really does answer prayer. God really does and everything's happening so fast. The problem is you're going to expect it to be fast the rest of your life. You're going to be in for a surprise. But it's fast, fast, fast because he's building security. He said, when you cry unto me, I'm going to answer. A child needs, when a child cries, a mother or father needs to answer that cry. They're built that way in order to, to develop. So, but the point comes where in this spiritual state this child that desires sincere milk of the word all of a sudden they're learning in the word the more they get into the word the more it's about serving God as opposed to him serving you and then they find out that they're getting stronger in God that the devil doesn't beat them up that they're basically trampling him underfoot and they're starting to get real confident. And they begin to see themselves as an instrument for God. And quite frankly, there's some, there's some old-time preachers on that to me have never graduated from that era. 
to me, they're still a young man because everything they preach and teach is what I can do. And that's a valid thing. By golly, if you can do it, teach it. Let someone else do it. But that young man stage says that I'm strong in the Lord. Uh, I've overcome the wicked one. I've got victory in my life. And I'm able to be strong in the word and overcome the wicked. Um, I don't run from the devil anymore. I'm, I'm basically overcoming this wicked one. And, but I'm most of the time, say that with me, most of the time, I, my view, my Christian view is what I can do. And you can get locked there for a long time. What I can do, what I have been, because I've desired the sincere milk of the word, I grew thereby. I've gotten strong. I've developed. I've matured. I've learned how to overcome the wicked one. I've got victory in my life. How do I know I got victory in my life? People are asking me to minister to them. That's a good sign because people don't go to a depressed person and ask them to pray for them. All right? If the person's depressed, they don't say, oh, I see you're depressed. Would you pray for me? All right. They're going to look, they're gonna look for a young man or woman that's got some zeal and some victory in their life and say, you pray for me. Of course, the ones asking them to pray for them are probably still here. I'm still blessing-centered. I'm still, what can I get out of this? Uh, and pretty much my Christian life revolves around me. And even though they love God and they're doing the best they can to learn, but desiring the sincere milk of the word, they're going to have to start eating strong meat. But strong meats belongs to them who are full age, who by reason of use. So... These young men, though, their world view as a Christian, their vision, this is redemptive because they're, they're recognizing God can provide for me. So you don't dismiss this altogether. You include this. But this one is a step up as far as their Christian outlook because they're saying, my redemption is that I can be a doer of the word, not just a hearer, and that I have value and that I have purpose and I am, I am ministering life to other people. And <laughs> they begin to see that I am moving. This is basically here. This is defensive living. Most, most of the time, they're running from the devil or running to somebody to get rid of the devil <laughs> for them. This over here is different. This is offensive. And somewhere there's been a vision adjustment to where most of the time they're in that mentality. That's a sure sign you've grown and matured. And so when the apostle says, I speak to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one, and the word of God abides in you strong, then they went, if the word of God abides strong, then they went beyond the sincere milk of the word, and they, they literally grew in the grace and in the knowledge of God, and now they're uh, able to do something. But the, the preoccupation with doing still trumps being. And when he says, I speak to you fathers, the goal is mature mothers and fathers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Not just five-fold ministers, but maturity needs to begin to lead the way. And maturity here, once you move into maturity, the attitude most of the time is not being an instrument, but being an expression. And the illustration uh, that I learned years ago, I think from, uh, um, he used was, if you had this attitude and you told your, your, your son or daughter, go and clean the garage. If they're in this area, and they go, why? That's the attitude of a child, why? And in some cases, because they're a child, you say, children, obey your parents for this is right. They're, they're, they're not in a place where they can understand why. You almost have to say as a parent, don't you, when they're children a little, because I said so? Because there's some things that they're not going to understand. You explain what you can explain, but isn't there a lot of times you just have to say, because I said so? Children, obey your parents, for this is right. 
That doesn't mean you're always going to understand why they said it, but it will develop something in you. Now, that same child say, go clean the garage. Why? Because I said so. Can eventually move into a young man or young woman where God says, go clean that garage. And, and dad says, because... I'm buying a used car for you. You're 16 and I'm getting a car. Do you think when they clean the garage there'd be a little different attitude? If I clean this garage, this is for my car. Oh yeah, I'm gonna clean the garage really good and I'm gonna get it all lined up for me, okay? So there, there's still a little bit of get here, but there's also this thing that I wanna do it to honor my dad. And it's like to honor my dad, I'm, I'm, I'm an instrument and I, don't, I wanna respect him. And, but this time I have a reason that there's actually a reward in obedience. I like that part. There's a reward in obedience. And you found out that over the years, like I had a friend who's, actually he was an eye surgeon and I was kind of his uh, prayer partner all through medical school. And uh, he was quiet, brilliant, but quiet. And his sister was mouthy and always talked back to her father and she was older than him and she wouldn't stop talking back. The father would slap her and she'd still keep talking and he'd slap her and she'd keep on talking. And he was the younger brother and he goes, you know, I said, when I grow up, I'm not gonna do that. All right, so you learn from even other people's mistakes, but he learned that's not wise to talk back. There's a consequence. And sometimes these young men and women learn there's a consequence that obedience has with it a reward. And you start to learn that as a young person. However, your outlook is still what I can do. But he says, I speak to you fathers, for you've known him who is from the beginning. That fathers is more concerned in being an expression. Remember Jesus said, Peter, have I been with you so long? When Peter wanted to see the father, he said, have I been with you so long? Having seen me, you've seen the father. It was more important to be an expression. And it was more important for a father to see that, that his desire is to bring many sons unto glory, to bring those that are here, here. And the illustration would be, and you could tell you're still a young man if you don't know the answer to what I'm about to say. If the father says, son, clean the garage. Now he understood the car part, right? because I'm getting you a car and we're gonna put it in there, so the garage needs to be cleaned, that was pretty logical. Son, I want you to clean the garage because grandpa's coming. How many know what the implication is there? To a father, that's totally understood. To a mature mother or father, there's no problem with that. The concept is simple, to honor my dad. He's not going to go in the garage, but I want him to know that he taught me well, and I want to show respect for him. And I'm going to honor him by showing him that I want to model and be a good witness for my household to honor him. Most don't think that way. In other words, most Christians would rather play on the swings than enjoy the children playing on the swings. A mother or a father wants to see more come from the children and see them exceed beyond them. They want to see them accomplish more than they ever accomplished. And the entire, the entire emphasis here is that it matches the eternal purpose with God. By the time you're a mother or father in Christ, it matches the eternal purpose. We talked about this in the first part. Part one, the eternal purpose began before the Garden of Eden, before there was a world. In eternity past, the father had determined, predetermined to have a pattern called Jesus Christ, his son. And that that son would be the pattern to bring many sons unto glory. That is the eternal purpose. And a father operates out of the eternal purpose, not operating out of a temporary goal, want, or desire. So mature mothers and fathers say that initially I have to learn how to be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I learned that 
I was a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with maturity, God brought me, even as a young man, into apostolic ministry. Perhaps that was my, my special calling, my specialty, or a businessman, or, or a pastor, or what have you. And in that place, I found a specific calling. But my general calling was the high calling of God in Christ Jesus to be an expression of the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And an expression of the Father is to bring many sons unto glory. That was the eternal purpose. I mean, that's the big picture that really every believer needs to be moving toward that. To what degree and how do you think most of the time? Okay? So in Galatians 1, we covered this last week. Uh, he said, my internal vision was that Christ would reveal his son in me. And Acts 26, 19, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. There needs to be a death to a legitimate way of thinking in order to grow. And it's almost like there's nothing wrong with this. We'll always be a child of God. We're always going to receive. But at what point can we simply die to it and believe that God will resurrect it in purity with a more mature, adjusted vision or outlook? All right. Does that kind of give you a, an easy idea of the same person, regardless of chronological age, has a Christian worldview, but that Christian worldview will depict its maturity as to how it thinks most of the time. Say that with me. Most of the time. Because all of us should think like this all of the time, all three. God is my source. I always look to see, make sure that, that whatever I'm doing, he's the source. I'm also looking that I have to be proactive and, and, and basically live the Christian life. You can't just talk it. You got to live it. But also, I want to see many sons come unto glory. And what am I doing most of the time to see that come to pass? One of the things this will do if you're truly operating as a mother and a father, you won't be a caretaker and you won't be an enabler and you won't be an undertaker. The undertakers are the ones that discourage everybody. Oh, you're not going to make it. You, know, you might as well give up. You'll quit. Wow, you're in bad shape. There's always undertakers in the church somewhere. But for the most part, I worry about the caretakers. The caretakers are trying to hold you up when you should be learning to stand up. And that's the difficulty. There's too many weak uh, weak, biblically literate Christians. <laughs> you know the Bible inside out and backwards, but you're not standing on your own. You're always looking for someone else to stand for you. And basically, we're a church of self-governance, which means we're going to teach you to stand. And matter of fact, some of you are going to not crawl. You're going you're gonna to get up on your feet and run, and fall down a lot, and then run some more and fall down a lot. But you're going to skip the crawling. You don't need that crawling stuff. That's for babies, right? So, all right. Now, this is the part that I promised a lady in North Dakota. Terry, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, I promised her, to, she says, these messages are getting me, and they're getting me, but you're not giving any prayer time on Ustream. I don't know what you're doing when Ustream's over, but you're not praying. So I said, okay, then I'm going to preach less, and we're going to pray more, all right? But here's the four. In order for you to get vision adjustment and to graduate, remember we used the, the illustration of... Uh, Egypt, get out of Egypt. Secondly, get into the land. Third, with kratos, I like this one, occupy. But then after you occupy, you want to advance and you want to be a blessing. In other words, when I occupy, it's not for my own self-interest. I'm occupying in a place of authority for the purpose of displacement. And uh, I don't think people get this part, this be a blessing, because this is others-oriented. If you are others-oriented, um, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to have to. When we did traveling ministry, every church we ministered to, we saw the weakness in these four areas. This is how I memorize it. I have to do it this way first. I, rem I memorize it as Jada because conceptually, every time we went to a church, I saw a weakness in understanding jurisdiction. I saw people acting 
without authority in dangerous areas where they, they really didn't belong and they were trying to do Christian stuff, but they, were, they didn't understand jurisdiction. They didn't understand that in someone else's realm, you don't make decisions for them in someone else's realm. Jennifer always used to laugh. One of the, one, uh, there were churches that actually told me what to preach. And having pastored 15 years before I did traveling, I was a little taken back by that. <laughs> I mean, I hear from God, but I would humble myself because that wasn't my jurisdiction, and I would preach exactly, even if I didn't have anything on it, I would honor them by preaching what they had, and the mo- sometimes the power of God fell stronger in those meetings than anything I ever preached by hearing from God for myself. And I think there's a lesson in that. The humility probably does a lot more than, than you think if you honor someone else's jurisdiction. You make decisions in someone else's jurisdiction, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be bad, it's not gonna work. The second thing that I saw was abdication. I saw young men and women, all ages, that were mighty in God, they were prophetically gifted or gifted with dreams and interpretation or gifted as speaker, teacher, even young pastors, but even though they were gifted, I kept seeing them quit. Every time something got hard, they quit. And I'm going, you've got to progress beyond, I know you're gifted and that you're, you're, you're marvelously gifted, but you're emotionally weak when you quit all the time. You can't do that. And as a matter of fact, if you're going to have any kind of a ministry and you, and you cancel all the time, those sheep are going to get so insecure because they are not going to feel safe. They're going to wonder why, gee, we have a home group, but we, we were supposed to meet every week, but now we meet once whenever they feel like it, and I'm not sure if they're going to cancel or they're not going to cancel. That makes sheep a little insecure. They're looking for strength. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for people who the show must go on whether it's comfortable or not. I come to church whether I got a headache or cold or cough, whatever. Other people basically decide on, on a whim how they feel. But other people, if you're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and you're going to grow up, you've got to quit quitting. Say that with me. Quit quitting. All right. There, quit that. All right. But abdicate and adjudicate comes with an understanding that as a young man or a young woman in God, wherever God sent you, especially when you testify and say, God gave me this job. Well, okay, God gave you that job, and then, and then after you get that job, you're ready to quit. That's telling me you are not leaning on the grace that God gave you. He sent you someplace. The grace is sufficient to rule in that area regardless of people and circumstances. As a matter of fact, he's testing you. I remember Rich gave a good teaching on a, on a Tuesday night. CCC, never forgot it. Complaining causes circles. They wandered in the wilderness, didn't they? CCC, you ought to write that down. Complaining causes circles. You want to go in circles? You can go in circles the rest of your life. Complaining causes circles. God's looking for people to adjudicate instead of abdicate. Adjudication means wherever you go, that's your jurisdiction. In that place, God has given you enough grace to rule and reign whether you like it or not. You do not have to run from anybody. And you don't have to quit thy job because you are miserable. That misery is an inability to stand in the grace of God and stand on your own two feet. I like the woman I had in my church that didn't like me. I don't know what I did that upset her, but whatever it was, I upset her. But I loved her attitude. You know what she's doing now? They said, well, what are you going to do? You're going to leave? Are you going to leave? And she goes, no, I'm going to pray him out. <laughs> and I says, as much as it didn't work, I admired that attitude better than a big baby running, offended, never telling anybody why they're offended. That's childishness. You know that? The Bible tells you at the very basic, if you have ought against anybody, go to that person. If you can't even do that, you're still in babyhood. And you'd be surprised how many so-called mature Christians still do that. They have an offense, but they never go to the person. They go to everybody but the person. Adjudication as opposed to abdication. 
D, if you adjudicate, if you stand your ground, if you let Jesus be Lord, the grace will be there to for displacement. Real spiritual warfare. Real spiritual warfare is when you go, wow, this place is demonic, yuck, and I'm going to stay here because greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. And if I can stay in the peace of God and the rule of God and go on the offensive and start releasing the love of God like a fire hydrant out of my belly, there is no demon or no flesh that can outlast the fruit of the Spirit. If it's outlasting you, it's because you had the potential to stand in the fruit of the Spirit and you abdicated. So don't blame God, yourself, and those other people. It's basically the failure to displace is the failure to allow the grace of God that is within you. But if there's the idolatry of self-preservation, those Jonah 2.8, you ought to write this down, Jonah 2.8, those who cling to useless idols forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. So what's that tell you? If you cling to, look out for me, I don't want my feelings hurt, so I quit. The idolatry there is you. And when you quit, you forfeit the grace that could have been yours. Okay? So, the last part is through displacement now, you occupied with displacement. Now you're ready for advance. I want to tell you something. I really believe that even what God is doing with our ministry, he basically is, we're in a time of advancement, but that advancement was not something that happened fast. Little by little, you have to occupy and the advancement comes when there is a displacement that nothing's stopping me. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do it because God said to do it, and I'm going to walk in that obedience whether I see results or not. And everything that we've had that prospered over the years was doing it with no results first. Everything. Everything we did, we did it with no results first. All the way from the time I was a baby Christian in the early 70s, when I got saved, God told me, and this seems so silly, he told me, I'm calling you to ministry, and I want you to go put a shirt and tie on and sit at your desk and read your Bible. And I felt like a total fool, and I think he wanted me to feel like that because he was checking more to see if I would do it or not. And from that time on, he's always done that to me, always. Even to the point of a sermon. Sometimes I think I've got it ready, and then at... Ten minutes before I walk in the door, he actually tells me the primary part of it. He likes to keep us dependent. You will never outgrow that dependency. But in that trust, it grows to be more and more implicit. And you don't question your circumstances so much. You simply say, how promptly can I obey what he's given me? When you promptly obey, you will advance and be the blessing. All right? So... Now I'm going to pray through the four that pertain to full stature ministry. I thought this was going to be faster than this, but one, two, three, four. You understood that? You understood the Egypt, right? Get out of Egypt, get into the promised land. Okay. Now after I get in the promised land, I've got to fight all these giants, all these ites, parasites, and other kinds of ites. Yeah. And... Then I was called, the children of Israel were called to be a blessing to the nations. So you're not done just because you get a victory and you don't just sit back and go, wow, I have advanced, I've occupied, I'm sitting in the armchair, I'm in the throne, I've got the, I've got the remote in my easy chair and I rule and reign in my living room. Well, good for you. But it's time to start teaching some other people how to gain that kind of victory instead of just sitting there and enjoying your victory. Actually, it got David in trouble. Do you know there's a portion of scripture that it says, you know when David saw Bathsheba and when he 
was on the balcony and he was observing her. Do you know what it says prior to that? It says, it was the spring of the year, a time when kings went out to battle. He didn't go out to battle. So in your victories, make sure that there's always a heart attitude for advancement. You never retire. So level number one, full FSM, Full Stature Ministries. This is what they've asked to pray through. One, heal the wounded. We have the tools. The second part is live it, a lifestyle of forgiveness. Intentional sanctification, we call it. The third element is basically moving on the offensive to occupy through displacement. Occupy is the word the Lord has given us that he says that basically we're in a season where the authority is going to be the kratos authority, dominion authority, meaning that true, we teach self-governance, but what God's saying is for a local church to be a governing church, there has to be a corporate expression of people that can stand and say we're moving forward to minister life to other people. It's not about us, it's about other people. We occupy, we have not only defeated the enemies in our own lives and dealt with our issues and our agendas, but we've learned to die to agendas, deal with the issues, and now the primary emphasis is to be an asset to the rest of the body of Christ. And that is, the last one is to, is to bring Many sons to glory is one way of saying it, but actually, the way Jennifer likes to say it, it's basically this last stage is to get these tools out to the church at large. Okay. To move from one to the other is going to require a vision adjustment. Do you agree? If you are beat up in the church, and the, there's a huge portion that is, we're going to pray through these one at a time. But I want to believe that some of you graduate. Some of you get a, a, a vision adjustment. And a vision adjustment is not a mental concept. It has to be a faith vision. It, you have to see through the eyes of Jesus that you've been centered on yourself long enough. And that if you are feeling safe and secure and you've got the tools to deal with, the, with, with your own issues and your own agendas, then say, God adjust my vision, let the scales fall from my eyes and let me see that this is not just to heal a few of my hurts and pains. I get calls all the time for people on the periphery or on the edge to help them. And I'm saying that most of the time, if they're way out there, they need a progressive way back in. In other words, they need saved, they need to get into the word, they need to stand on their own two feet, they need to apply themselves. I can't wave a magic wand and heal the ails of everything that everybody's in. That's old time church. That's depending on somebody to just do it to you. When in reality, what we're saying is, I'll give you the tools and it will change and you can make something of your life rapidly, quickly. Do you want that? As a matter of fact, the demand was so heavy, we had to put a lot of policies into place for Jennifer and I not to minister to people because the demand is greater than any one person can handle. And taking appointments is almost an impossibility anymore. And because it's not this church here, it's not this room, it's literally from around the world in geographical areas. But what we do to find out who's serious and who's not 
and if you're watching by Ustream, you better do this first, is if we give you homework, I expect you to do it. If you don't do the homework, I'm going to move to someone else because there's too much need. Nobody's going to be babied. If you won't do your part, I can't give the time or my pastors or our staff to give you time to do something for you that you should be doing for yourself. We're not enablers. We're not caretakers. We're risk takers. And that means I want to train a people that will go and, and minister to the people nobody else wants to minister to and have the tools to know what to do about it, but also know that those people have the same tools within them, and if they won't tap into it in, on, in their own selves, I can't do anything with them. It's not about me doing to you. It's about me showing you that you have the ability to do this yourself. Isn't that what parents want for their children? Don't you want them to stand on their own two feet and be strong, that if something happened to you, you know that they're going to make it in life? Because the church has not been good at that. The church has been to where the pastors have made the people dependent on them to be the source of grace. Wrong. You've got the source of grace in you. We're supposed to be equipping you to use your tools. So healing the wounded is the first place. If you're wounded, I sympathize with you. If a person comes in here really beat up, you know what they need? They don't need to be, uh, have something to do. They don't need to fix this or fix that or clean the restrooms or do this or do that. What they need to do is to feel safe and secure. If they feel safe and secure, then they can open up. If they can open up, they can get healed. Once they get healed, they begin to see that God is faithful, that they can do it. They start standing on their own two feet. They get confident. And one of the first things that happens without anybody telling them that, if the heart's right, is they want to help somebody else. If they don't want to help somebody else, then they stayed locked in as a baby forever. But if they say, you know what? I don't even know what I'm doing yet, but I'm going to help somebody with this. That's a good sign. That's a sign that there's somebody you could, there's somebody that's going to go with it. And after they help somebody else, they're going to go help people and they will come back with questions worth answering. The questions I don't really care to answer are the ones that never tried to help anybody and then they have questions. You go help somebody and the questions you have are going to be redemptive questions. And it's going to be troubleshooting and it's going to teach you to help be a people helper beyond anything you've known before. But if you don't want to help anybody else, most of the questions you ask will all pertain to you. And that's very limiting, isn't it? If all of your questions just about me, myself, and I. But if you start ministering, even in your wounded state, once you see that it works, Go start with someone else with what you know. Say, hey, I don't really know much about this stuff, but here's what I did. And boom, it starts working. You're going to start seeing an effectiveness, and you're going to start, all of a sudden, there's going to be an adjustment in your vision. And you're basically going to go, you know what? I've got wounds, but I've got value. And God's showing me my value because it's intrinsic, and it's rising up in me. I'm starting to have God confidence all of a sudden. Church can't make that happen for you. I can't lay hands on you. You can be God confident. You have to, by reason of use, get God confident. And if you don't use it, you don't get God confident. But all of a sudden, you're going to see that there is, there is something to this life. And every time then you go back and say, God, deal with me further. I want to go deeper and get closer to you. You'll learn something that you can then help someone else with. And then you learn something else, something else, something else. The more you deal with you, the more you can help somebody else. Then all of a sudden you begin to see that, you know what? If one can chase a thousand to 10,000, all of a sudden you start to grow up beyond babyhood and you realize that I could do corporately something that I couldn't do individually. And that interdependence all of a sudden is not far-fetched now. Interdependence is more like a teamwork, and that teamwork, I can accomplish things, and basically, I can move into any arena and walk in victory. Any arena, hostile environments. And then when you, once you see that you can do that, I can't believe you wouldn't want to teach others how to do that. I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine once you walk in victory in some places that you thought were impossible, you're going to say, you know what? If I can do this, anybody could do this. Somebody says, Dennis, when did you start discipling? And I says, I think God put something in my spirit as a baby Christian, and it was almost immediate. 
And that was, if Dennis can do it, anybody can do it. And that was one of the healthiest concepts I ever had because I never lost sight of that. I always say, if I can do this, so can you. And that actually equipped people faster than if you have this expectation, I'm the expert, no, don't try this because you can't do this. Only us spiritual people really can do this. So watch me perform instead, right? That's the other alternative. But if you say, hey, you can do this, I can do this, anybody can do it, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna move to the place to where all of a sudden you're going to want to see them grow. So let's, let's pray graduation for these, huh? If you're wounded, we want you to get the healing. But if you're wounded, we also want you to already start lifting your vision a little higher that whatever God heals in me, I'm going to give it away and I'm going to try to help someone else whether it's in your family, friends, neighbors, business. Because someday you're going to stand before the Lord and you say, you mean, you mean you stood in Dennis's ministry and he taught you how to help people and you didn't help people? You don't think you're going to be accountable? Well, I, I was, I'm kind of, you know, like I, I wasn't comfortable. Actually, by the way, just your little free part, that's where, that's where we keep the church small. At least we have is as soon as people feel like I'm not comfortable, <laughs> they go, I'm out of here. I'm not comfortable. I'd rather afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, and then we're accomplishing something. All right? So let's, let's pray through these. Point number one. And if you're watching on Ustream, I want you to pray through this. And you say... Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, my vision pretty much is all about me because I'm kind of hurting. And, and you're telling me that, that, that you can give me the tools for Christ the healer in me to do the work and that I don't need experts, that I've got Christ in me and he's more than sufficient and he's my exceedingly great reward. Then God, uh, I receive forgiveness for having been a baby perhaps too long. And I think God honors humility. And if you say, you know what, I've been kind of needy and my Christian world is pretty much revolved around me and what I get. I'm asking to change that. And I want to die to the fact, I want to die to even some of my plans and visions and I want you, right now, God, to just take my heart, just like, see, I know a lot more now than when I first got saved. And when I first got saved, I said, God, I give you my whole heart. But I didn't really know what I was doing. And now I know what that means. So therefore, it's, I'm more accountable now. And it's going to mean more to God right now if you say, God, I give you my whole heart, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. It's going to mean a lot more now than it did when you were a newborn, because you know what you're saying now. So, Father, I give myself to you afresh and anew. And I'm saying that baby part in me needs to grow up and stand on its own two feet. No more asking everybody in the world to pray for me. But, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deepen and develop my relationship with you. So I receive forgiveness for having been stuck with a vision that is, quite frankly, a little too centered on me. I've been in the faith long enough now that it's time to change, it's time to graduate, it's time, and this is what the Spirit of the Lord is doing right now. He said, I'm going to cause you to lift your vision higher. I'm going to cause you to look up. I'm going to look, look, look up until from your hurts and your wounds and basically say, God, not only is this for my healing, which is the most basic awareness that I have is that I feel better when I receive forgiveness and cleansing and healing my broken heart and your anointing is to heal the broken hearted but God I want to live in that abundant life I want to make a forgiveness lifestyle a lifestyle I want to lift my vision to where it's not just getting a healing to feel better running place to place to get deliverance but rather allowing Christ to deliver in me to do that work and no more running away, no more isolating, no more, no more running every time there's pressure or uncomfortableness. I'm going to face my pain 
and what the Lord's saying right now, and I'm just getting a word, and I don't know who this is for. It's probably for a lot of people. But he's saying, basically, you've got to get to the point where you're going to face your pain. And for some of you, it's pain if you stay, and it's pain if you go. Choose your pain. But don't think for a moment there's a painless way. The work of the cross is always. It's pain if you go. It's pain if you stay. But face your pain. And make your decision knowing that I'm going to face my pain and I'm going to allow God to work in my life regardless of the circumstances. And I'm going to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. And you're going to lift my vision from babyhood to being a young man or a young woman that is basically going to learn to stand on my own two feet. And I'm going to be the one that people are going to ask to pray for instead of me running around looking for people to pray for me. There's going to be a transition. I'm going to get strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I'm going to overcome the wicked one. I'm going to learn to deal with my own issues. I'm going to quit telling the world and all Christians that, that as a baby, uh, I'm under spiritual attack all the time. You're not under spiritual attack. Your own carnality is attacking you. There's too many big name leaders that are not under the kind of spiritual warfare you are. Think it out logically. How come they're not being attacked? They have worldwide ministries and they're not being attacked like you are. It's because your own carnality is attacking you. If that witnesses to you, then you need to repent. Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive forgiveness for, for all what I call spiritual warfare is really my own flesh attacking me and the shallowness of my relationship with God, to be blunt. And so I receive forgiveness for that, and I humble myself, melt into the love of God, and say, God, I'm going to begin to stand and be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to face my pain and overcome it, because I'm going to face that pain till Christ himself in me walks to that pain, through that pain, and carries it away. That is the promise for me for the cross. No more running away, no more fighting and attacking, no more going round and around complaining about it. I'm going to win the victory by keeping and maintaining the peace of God, and I'm going to through the power of displacement, become a strong young man or woman of God. I'm going to move from babyhood to a young man or a woman where the word of God abides strong and I've overcome the wicked one and I've got enough victory in my life. People are asking me to pray for them for a change. Make that graduation. Make that adjustment in your vision and start looking at life that way and grow up. It's, it's cute when a little baby when a little baby kind of slobbers but when they're 25 years old and they're slobbering it's no longer attractive. All right, So God's saying some of you need to grow up. All right. What was attractive as a baby is no longer attractive. So father right now, and there are sons and daughters that say, I'm strong in the word of God and I've got ministry and I've got this and I can do that and I can do this. And we're all saying, wonderful. How about die to it right now and let it burn. Let God raise it up in resurrection, life and impurity. Take your ministries, your ideas, your visions, your, and let, and, and die to it. If it's really God, you won't be afraid to die to it. You won't be afraid. If it's an idol, you'll be afraid to die to it. But if it's really a vision from God. He'll raise it right out of the ashes with a purity and a clarity and you're going to get more insight than you've ever had before. Revelation, he's going to change your eyesight and the scales will fall from your eyes. So Father, as a young man and a young woman of God, no matter how long you've been in, in the faith, you could still be a young man or a young woman based on what I do in ministry, what I do in ministry, what I do in ministry. God's saying, I want you to die to that and I want to show you, just like I did Abraham, that, uh, that you want your offspring to be more numerous than the stars in the sky. You want to affect the multitudes beyond measure, that God wants to use an individual life to affect that. And quite frankly, some of you already have the tools that you could be affecting multitudes, even in your own jurisdiction. You could begin, if you would start sowing into the lives of seeing young men and young women grow up to have more than what you had and quicker than what you had and rejoice more in their well-being than in your own situation. It's time to grow up out of that situation, out of, out of that easy chair, even if you've accomplished great things. It's dangerous to accomplish great things. To accomplish great things and sit on your laurels, you will stand before the Lord for that. To accomplish great things, you should be doing something with those great things by being a blessing to somebody else investing to the very last breath that you have. You should be investing in the kingdom and advancing the kingdom. You should be adjudicating. 
you should be advancing in the kingdom. So Father, there's a call right now, the Kingdom Life Church. And quite frankly, uh, I believe all along that the whole reason God had me name this Full Stature Ministries many, many, many years ago was that we're not going to tolerate babies. This is not a babysitting class. This is not a, 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 an old folks home uh, for retirees. This is basically going to be someone that's going to teach you to war in the days, all the days of your life, as long as you've got breath in your lungs, you're going to wage warfare against the enemy, and you're going, to, you're going to occupy and advance the kingdom of God on planet Earth, and that peace is going to remove chaos in people's lives, and you're going to be an instrument of bringing peace where there's chaos. And wherever there's chaos, you're going to welcome the chaos. You're not going to run from the chaos. You're going to say, here's some chaos that I can move in, and by because greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. Through the power of displacement, we're going to advance the cause of the kingdom there. And, we're, and God is still swallowing up chaos because he's the God of peace. His kingdom knows no end. So, Father, we pray there's too many young men and women that stopped at the age of being young men and women. And they're so focused on their gifts and their callings that they've lost sight of all the people that need to be trained up and grown up and taught to stand on their own two feet and to start seeing uh, them uh, surpass you. There's too much competition, competitiveness, and covetousness. A father, right now, if you're going to ever move from a young man or a young daughter in the kingdom, if you're going to move, you're going to die radically to covetousness competing and comparing. As long as that is still in you, you will not be a mature mother or father. You cannot be a mature mother or father. You cannot get the vision adjustment as long as there's competing, comparing, and coveting. And what you're looking around and you're competing, you're comparing, or you're coveting what somebody else has, you have not gone to the place of, of spiritual death and resurrection. You need to take that Isaac of whatever that idolatry is in the heart and take it to the altar and die and let God resurrect it with purity and give you a vision to truly love other people. I speak to you fathers and mothers for you've known him who was from the beginning and that your heart and your passion is to be is to be an expression of the living God and that expression is to be a father unto sons but you will always be a son unto the father. You would never, never lose sight of the fact that you will always be a son or a daughter unto the father but you would need to be a father unto sons. You need to be a mother unto sons and daughters. You need to be an expression of God so that they can stand on their own two feet and be all that they were called to be. There's a call now for mature mothers and fathers for God saying, I'm about to bring forth a wave of my spirit. It's going to be a tidal wave of maturity. Uh, I mean, a tidal wave of, of, of multitudes. And these multitudes are going to be babies. And I do not need babies raising babies. I need mature mothers and fathers that will be a net. And that net is going to be a network of maturity. And that network of maturity is going to be like an army. For I am doing three things. I am preparing my bride. I am equipping an army. And I'm growing a family. And God's saying at that same time, I'm doing it right here in Kingdom Life Church. I'm doing that around the world in little groups all over the place. There are little groups, small groups that are going to be like little fire campfires. But they're going to glow and that the glory is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God's saying, um, where two or three are gathered in my name, where God's moved with us, uh, Jennifer and I, with a oneness anointing, you're going to see that oneness anointing popping up all over the, around the world. But I'll tell you what, without a mother or father there, it's not going to happen on its own. We've got enough orphan spirit children. We've got enough people who have not been properly mothered or fathered. And God says, I'm, I'm giving a clarion call. There's going to be people that don't even understand what's going on. But all of a sudden, they're going to want reparented, even if they don't even know what reparent thing is because God said I placed the solitary in families for this purpose to mature and equip but there are too many people with giftings and callings and they won't bounce anything off they won't su submit to any kind of authority because they're still feeling that freedom is independence and God says there is a false independence in my church the false independence is one thank God you're not sickly dependent but point two in that rugged independence you have not matured to be interdependent and God says so grow up quit rejoicing in the fact that you can stand on your own two feet and realize that you're not capable of functioning interdependently yet that should be the challenge for the mothers and the fathers it's a beautiful thing to see somebody stand on their own two feet, but it's an even more beautiful thing when those people that can stand on their own two feet are so secure in God that they can function interdependently. And if one can chase a thousand to ten thousand, God's going to bring us to the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature man. And at stage one, 
I'm going to go back through this list. I just feel like we got to go back to this one. Write this thing at the most basic element. We're going to pray through removing the walls of hostility that God can make one new man from the two. Jew and Gentile is the one new man, but it's also a strategy. And God's saying that as I called Gideon, that you shall strike the enemy as one man, that God's saying, I'm going to do as a loaf. I'm going to do with a loaf, even in, even in uh, like a little Bethlehem. I'm going to take out of obscurity and take that loaf, and it's going to roll into the enemy's camp, and it's going to be just like the sword of Gideon. It's going to be striking the enemy as one man, and numbers aren't going to matter because it's going to be it's going to be out of the corporate flow and that anointing that I'm going to accomplish my purpose. And God says that I have broken down the wall of hostility between the two. And I'm breaking down even now the wall of hostility between brothers and sisters in Christ and saying that when those walls break down at stage one, when you begin to move in forgiveness and quit being such a baby and saying, I preach the gospel of forgiveness, I just don't do it. All right? That's, not, that's another gospel. So, Father, we're praying right now that even now the Spirit of God is convicting people that they preach the gospel of reconciliation, but they don't reconcile. They preach and say they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is, is peace. All of the doctrines of Jesus are doctrines of peace. But if you won't live in peace, you're talking out of two sides of your mouth. It's time to, to, to repent from that childishness of being offended. The blame game is over because of Jesus Christ and the, what he took on the cross, the blame game is done, finished. No more blaming God, self, or others. It's basically melting into the love of God and being all that you can be. And secondly, we're going to pray through this one. And Bill Morford is a good example of that. What stood out to me when he taught me what was in his translation of the Bible that was the most important thing, and this really touched me. He said, Dennis, you're one of the few people that still preach the cross. And he says, and <laughs> not only that, he says, but everything in his translation that the English language doesn't have is continually, continually, continually. Forgiveness and repentance was meant to be a continual flow, not choppy, isolated incidents. It, it was to be a lifestyle that if you walk continually, seek, ask, knock. No, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. It was to be a flow of a river. The will of God is a river. It's not a place and a plan alone. It's a river. And that continual river flows out of the abundance. You abide in him and you pray constantly is a continual flow of relationship and out of that relationship or out of that that continual flow you will basically see that it's a lifestyle and in that lifestyle all of a sudden you realize that most of the time I don't have to repent or forgive because I'm beginning to deal with anything that's even remotely a temptation I'm allergic to anything that comes between me and my God. And anything that stops that flow, even momentarily, I'm allergic to anything that comes between me and my Jesus. And it will teach and train you in lordship, and it'll train you in a lifestyle. You need to say, Father, I don't know what he's talking about right now. Then I repent, God, for my lack of application then, because I've got the tools. Now I've got to say, God, this day, this day I commit myself afresh and anew to new application. In Jesus' name. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture out, even hit and miss, I'm going to venture out into developing a forgiveness, repentant lifestyle to where it's a continual flow out of my life and that when things come my way, they are temptations, I release it immediately. I'm not just going to get healed of rejection. I'm going to not accept rejection. I'm going to walk offensively in the state of a lifestyle. I'm going to move into that third element to where I'm going to occupy. And when I occupy, whatever comes against me is going to come in the form of a temptation. It's going to feel yucky and I'm going to go, I'm not taking that in. I release a river of love of God. Drop down, get your peace, because peace will guard your heart. And as soon as you got your peace, then release a love of God. Two stages. You're in a hostile environment. Somebody's rejecting you. You drop down, get the peace of God that guards your heart from taking it in. It can't penetrate peace. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. And then release the love of God offensively toward them in the midst of it. And God will teach you to occupy. And we're going to start moving in and displacing. And God's got places for you of advancement. But unless you do it in your heart, the advancement's not going to come. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It's God that lifts up one, puts down another. And this last element, God's saying, I'm going to tell you what. You start occupying like that, and you 
you're going you're gonna to have the ability to, to draw sons and daughters unto God and get them to stand on their own two feet. And I'm going to bring them from the north, south, east, and west. And I'm going to bring sons and daughters who really want to be all that they can be and who are willing to die to their agendas and die to their selfish visions and die to anything where any idolatry has crept in or any tainting and let it rest on the altar and God will raise it in purity out of the ashes in resurrection life and there will be a purity and the scales will fall from their eyes and they'll see exactly what God had planned for them all along with great purity. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.